Welcome to the Shining Force 3 Scenario 2 Ruins Walkthrough. This is PDK and we're going to quickly be going through all six ruins of Scenario 2, showing you the best routes, all the treasures, and my personal strategies for going about them in the most effective manner. We're going to be starting with Ruin 1 of Chapter 1. Now it's pretty straightforward so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it just quickly. You can see the entrance to the south where you begin and to the west, the thief's entrance. Now you notice in the middle there, there's some sand capped off by a couple of barrels, which are naturally going to impede your way. Now to the north of those barrels, the major treasure chest, which only has a silver ring. To the east of where you begin, a healing drop that anybody can open up. And to the northeast, the exit that the thief will take. The best route is to just head straight north, hit the barrel to the right, and turn right and use Campbell to strike the thief either with a spear or a lance so make sure he has a spear as well because the thief might be slightly out of range. I normally just send one other person usually rock to pick up the healing drop on the right and that's pretty much it. So now we have chapter 2's ruins. This one is a little bit more going on but still pretty simple so from here on out we will be using actual video of the game and it's pretty straightforward fair. Now, as per usual, you want to have your fastest person to spec, in this case it's Median, benefiting from the boost that the Rapiers give him. And everybody else goes in. Now, with this Ruin, four is the sweet spot. You really don't need to send more than four people in at one time. My four typically will be Hazuki, Zero, Campbell, and just one other person. It might be Bernard, it might be Waltz might be rock it's really a question of who gets there first but Campbell Hazuki and Zero were the three you really want in there Campbell naturally because he's a knight so he's tailor-made for the ruins except for the fact that he can unintentionally kill the thieves too soon so you guys want to bear that in mind with your cavalier units Zero is good because he can fly so he's not slown down by any sort of terrain Hazuki is good because she has the movement of a knight without the terrain impediments and also she has tornado which means she can always do a small amount of damage and it's a guaranteed attack so she's the best person on medians team for picking up treasure so here we have the thief picking up the first item which is a healing drop not too important but if you're a completionist you know or actually use healing items it doesn't hurt to pick it up but what we really want is what's in those other couple of chests the mithril and the protect ring. There's the protect ring right there. The mithril was already picked up, so they're going to make their break for it, except they're not gonna get away because we have Campbell stationed right there. And you see here, I'm making sure I equip the right weapon because the lance might do too much damage. As you can see there, a critical hit from the spear at zero rank was still almost enough to kill him. So with that, we pick up the first item, which is the mithril. Zero can come over here and I wanted to use a weaker weapon on him, but he doesn't have one at the moment because there is a good chance that he is going to just outright kill that thief. Yeah, I see that being a strong possibility, but you know, it really doesn't matter because this thief only has one item and he's dead. He is dead a couple of times over and pick up the healing drop. So that just leaves the most important item, the protect ring. And Hazuki's going to be left in charge of that. And here you see Tornado used to good effect. I normally put the Protect Ring straight away on her. Because I find that she's mainly lacking in defense at this stage of the game. And she normally has that up until Chapter 4 and then some. It's a good item for her. She's one of the best candidates to have it. And also its ability to cast Heal 2 is very helpful. Zero is another good candidate. But the thing is, he's going to be leaving your party several times up until... A battle in chapter 5 when he joins for good so you don't want to leave him with too many important items because when he's gone you have no way of getting them until he returns so keep that in mind and that's it for chapter 2 on to ruins 3 so now we're in chapter 3 this ruin is a little bit annoying because for some reason they decided to throw you a curveball and the ruin won't activate automatically without you inspecting it depending on your proximity to the entrance so you see it's on top of that mound there. So you want to be very careful how you place your characters. I did a lot of experimenting to try to find, you know, the grace range. Where could I sit my people without the thief showing up? 
So if you watch here, I'm just showing off places that you can stand your people to get them in position to move them in as soon as possible. Now, if you see where Synthesis and Hazuki are standing, well, I'll just wait a second to let Medium deal with the skeleton. I want you to be able to see what I'm referring to on screen. There is a space in front of Hazuki and a space in front of Synthesis. You can also send a couple of people and station them in those two spots directly north of them. And it will also not trigger the thief just yet. So keep that in mind. Any other spot around there, the thief will show up. So we're just going to bide our time. This ruin also doesn't have anything too important. It just has a black ring, which is mostly useless, but not completely. And another large mithril, which you get plenty of in this game. But again, it's there. It's free items. So why not? Also, this ruin has a lot of skeletons in there, so if you're like me and look for every good opportunity to give your people extra weapon experience or friendships without having to grind, per se, this ruin is a good excuse to do it. And that's another reason why destroying barrels is always a good option, because they will afford you the most weapon experience points. And it's an easy hit. Five experience points, well, four to six experience points per kill for a barrel, so always take out barrels preferably with the character who is not maxed out in their weapon ring so you don't need to send a lot of people into these ruins but I normally just send in as many people as I can just to make things easier make sure that nobody gets blocked off by the skeletons we can still get to the thief so if you look at the screen you see all the places where I can stand everybody now I move Hadoba there or Hedva as she's known now by the current translation and that activated the thief so keep this in mind but no, I send as many people as possible for that reason. Just making sure to leave out a healer, which in this case would have to be Uriudo. And my ranged attackers to back up Median because the enemies might try to swarm him off screen while everybody else is dealing with the treasure. Don Hort will be out there because Don Hort, well, he's Don Hort. There's only so much he can do at this stage. And Rock usually stays out too because he's weak to the skeleton's weapon and he can provide Median with some extra defense if their friendships are up. So he's another good person to leave out. The Succubus is the main concern on this map, only because of Blaze 2 and Charm. That's it. So we're in a position to move our people in. As you can see, a mob of skeletons. What's that, around seven skeletons? And one thief. Two treasure chests. Now, again, about the treasures, the Black Ring, I said, is not quite useless, only because it can be used to cast Blaze 2. I had to think about that. <laughs> it casts Blaze 2. Now, you can't use it as an item until your character is promoted, but any promoted character can use it as a regular item. There's a chance of it cracking, but unlike Shining Force 1 and 2, in this game, items cannot break for good. When they crack, they're automatically broken and can't be used again until you repair them, but they're always repairable. I've been told that there's a trick similar to Shining Force 2's caravan where you can drop them in the headquarters, bring them back, and they will be fixed automatically. I haven't tried it for myself, but I heard there's a way to do that. I don't know if that works across all scenarios or just particular ones because there are some tricks that are not interchangeable between scenarios, but that's another topic for another video. So again, I like to abuse the skeleton's presence here to give my characters more friendships and weapon experience points, particularly Campbell and David, since they have weapons that are strong to skeletons, they're good candidates for the ruin, plus they both have good movement. David has movement to 6, not as good as 7, but he is unaffected by most terrain, so he's one of your best movement characters. I usually give him a nimble onion or running pepper as it's now known later on in the game to make him even more effective in that area. But I, I, I switch it up. I use different characters for that. Sometimes I give the running pepper to him. Sometimes I give it to Hera to make her more useful as a monk. Sometimes I give it to my healer, Yuryudo. Sometimes I give it to one of my casters, Hedva or Synthesis. You know, I mix it up a bit. I never give it to Hazuki because she is one character who does not need it at all. So as you can see here, doing what I said I was doing earlier, just taking care of the skeletons. Because there's not much to do, we're just trying to catch up to the thief. Now you will note that in this ruin, both of the treasure chests are the standard color. That means they're regular treasure chests, which means if we get to them in time, before the thief, we can actually open up both of the chests before he does. So there's a lot of different ways you can go about dealing with this ruin, if you so choose. And yeah, you're not going to do anything to him. Oh, quick pro tip about David. For those not in the know, don't be fooled by his beginning stats. Now, the stats in this game are randomized for certain characters, most characters. So, 
and this happens this is generated when you generate a new game so anytime you start a new playthrough pay attention to your character's starting stats you may notice that with a lot of characters it's not the exact same as it was in the previous game i've had games where david's starting stats were pretty pretty respectable and i've had some where he was kind of uh lackluster in some areas so if you're noticing your characters seem a little weaker or less effective than they have been in the past it's probably because of that not to mention the rng and random level ups but he normally starts off pretty decent every area except defense considering he starts off rank zero in his weapons but my pro tip is do not promote david ever until he is at least level 14 because at level 13 and 14 he almost always almost always gets a plus three in attack which is unheard of in shiny force 3 for an unpromoted character so that basically makes him equal to a median or campbell for attack and this makes up for the fact that he only has access to the ranged weapons so he can attack from a distance but still has commendable attack so please keep that in mind if you're using david do not promote him until level 14 give him that extra six in attack it makes all the difference so and i say almost always because in my experience i've played scenario 2 come all the way through well over 20 times i'm not lying i've played the shiny force 3 series far more than it should be legal but each of those times every single time he's always got a plus three attack at level 13 and level 14 unpromoted but i have read from one player on the sfc shiny force central forums that he had played through one time and was annoyed to find that david did not get that plus three in attack at level 13 myself personally i've never experienced this but to give them the benefit of the doubt that their story is accurate i'm just going to say that he almost always he generally he usually will get that plus three so keep that in mind and if worse comes to worse you can always save the game beforehand before the level up and then see what happens but i've never had him not get that so and also remember with the saturn has a nice soft reset trick you can always press A, B, and C plus start at the same time to quickly back out to the main title screen. This works for virtually any Saturn game I've played. And Shiny Force 3, Scenario 2 and 3, not Scenario 1, Scenarios 2 and 3 take it a step further. Very useful. It's almost like having a save state feature on the console game. After a save, if you hold A, B, C start and continue to hold the buttons while the screen is black, continue to hold them until you hear the music kick in, the game will automatically load up your most recent save file. In your most active save file so if you save before something important like a, a level up and you want certain stats or you're not sure about a certain action you think you might be doing something stupid it might lose a character save at a good opportunity beforehand if you need to reset or reload hold a b and c and start but don't just press them and let go hold them until the screen loads back up your most recent save will be right there so that saves a lot of time i wish scenario one had it it's a great feature so if you didn't know about that please make use of that and this works on the console version. This is not an emulator thing. This is an actual Saturn hardware. So, not talking about the ruins because not much to it. We just finished off the thief. Got all the items there. Now, I send my casters into the ruins sometimes too because with their magic and their low melee ability, they're also good candidates to do minimal damage to the thief. You don't want to overpower him too soon and kill him before you get all the treasure. And that pretty much does it for this ruins. I'm showing off the items we got. Hazuki had picked up the large mithril there. Sintisa's got the black ring, which is going to be useful for picking up items in ruins. Because again, Blaze 2 for my item is going to do very little damage. So it's a good way to make sure that the thief will not die, but will also drop his item. And that does it for Chapter 3's ruins. We're going to be taking off and see you in a bit in Chapter 4. Alright, welcome to Chapter 4's ruins. We're going to be picking up a special character here, except there's a very unique way to do it. So I'm going to show you an uh, alternative method of recruiting him. Here, the focus is on Zero. He's our hero of this episode because he is required to pick up this character and all of the treasure, actually, in this ruin. Now, there are a lot of different ways you can approach this. I'm just going to show you the most surefire, foolproof way to do this. Beforehand, you didn't see this off screen. I use the swift boots and the support spell from the Ankh to boost everybody's agility except for Zero. I wanted to put as many characters in before Zero as possible and you'll see why in a second. Hadova was the fastest so she had to inspect but everybody else who I could I put in there. And this is temporary. I don't need that many people in there so some of them will probably come back out but that was just to do a certain thing in a moment. Everybody who's not already in there can stay out. They can just help guard Median since he can't go in. 
He's the only character who cannot enter the ruins. Don Hart won't enter because he's Don Horn. We've already established that. But you can see here, the way the ruins work is the later a character enters, the farther up they will be in relation to the formation. So Zero is up front and center because he was one of the last people to enter. That's very important and you'll see why in just a moment. Whatever you do, do not send Zero in first and I'll show you why momentarily. Now, also I'm going to give him the swift boots here that she was holding to increase his agility because we want Zero to have the first turn from here on out in this ruin. Everybody else will assume their positions. Now you see Zero and see, because of his position, he was able to move farther than he normally would. Now there's a switch there and there's a switch to the south as well. We're going to actually use the swift boots as an item too. I'm not taking any chances. We want to boost his agility. And thankfully they did not crack. So he's wearing the swift boots. They've given him a boost. And if I haven't equipped him with the rapier, oh wait, I did. I remember seeing it. So he has a rapier, which is going to naturally increase his agility as well. So... After this turn, he should be the fastest person by far in the ruin, on my team at least, and we want that. He has to have his actions first to make this as painless as possible. Now, it's counterintuitive. You think that the switch on the north would activate the northernmost door, the switch to the south would activate the southern door, but the game is trolling you. The game is playing with your mind. This northern switch is actually going to activate the southernmost door which is the door that our people have access to initially. So you want to activate that switch first. Otherwise, you can pretty much kiss getting the treasures goodbye. Still possible to get the special character here, but you're not going to get the treasure, which is a nice bonus. So we're continuing to get everybody in position. Now for this ruin, you can send as many people as you like. You definitely want to send in David because of his movement. You definitely want to send in Hazuki. She has the best movement. You want to send in Campbell because he's a knight character. Anybody who has a low weapon rank or whose weapon rank you want to boost, good idea to send them in too because there are a lot of barrels in this ruin. And again, what have we established about barrels? Easy weapon experience. You get the maximum for each one. You want to break them. But keep in mind, later in the game, we have access to things like Spark 2. Don't use AoEs if you can avoid it to break multiple barrels at once. You'll get more EXP, true, but it's just the same EXP added up and it all counts as five weapon experience points. The same for taking out one barrel. It doesn't multiply. So the most efficient way to get weapon experience from barrels is to take them out one at a time individually. The same goes for the ice pillars in a particular battle in chapter five of scenario three, which is pretty obvious when you come to it. Always take out barrels one at a time when you can. So now we're activating the southernmost switch and that has opened up all the doors. So now we have free reign. We can relieve the thieves of that treasure that's weighing them down. Zero can, you know, he's pretty much done his job at this point. He can stick around. He can join the rest of the characters. It really doesn't matter. However you want to use him. Here was usually behind in the weapon experience, so she's a good character to take out some barrels with. I know she won't do much damage even with a critical attack, so we're going to hit the thief, get the first strike, and get our first treasure. Large mithril there, which is the least important item in here. There's also something in one of the barrels. There's a small mithril in the barrel closest to our team uh, it's to the east though so not the one that we're closest to on screen here it'll be the other one which I'll show off in a second David here's gonna use the black ring to show that off again very little damage to the thieves and if they both still had treasure this would actually grab both treasures so keep that in mind as well and the thieves have a high magic resistance to most spells so that's another good reason to use magic in them Kazuki has the tornado spell, keep that in mind. Also has the shuriken, so at this stage she's not too strong with them. I will use her to take out this barrel, and there you can see, voila, we have a small mithril, which is actually more valuable than the large mithril because small mithrils are much harder to come by. Julian can get a hit on this thief. Now, interesting. Thing about the thieves AI they're very quirky in this ruin and this ruin alone they are hardwired to not attack you well I won't say hardwired in certain situations maybe it's possible they'll attack you but in my experience at least with this placement they will not attack you they'll just kind of stick around even though I'm blocked them off they've pretty much just given up at this point so you can pretty much do what you want to do right now so I'm going to take out the rest of the barrels in my leisure 
And that's pretty much that. Really don't have anything else to add right now, so we'll just let it unfold. You'll note there she only got four experience points. That does happen on occasion. With barrels, the mean or the average is five experience points, but on occasion, you will only net four, and even more rarely, you will net six. So anywhere from four to six experience points. Not really sure how the game determines how much you'll get. Again, just taking out barrels to get that weapon experience. Good way to catch characters up. Anybody who joins after the first couple of chapters is always a little behind in weapon experience anyway, so whatever you can do to speed them up, their growth. Normally, this is where you would activate Robbie and then take out the thieves. I want to show off another thing that you can do here, so I'm going to just take out the thieves and then we're done with this ruin. There goes one. And yeah, I don't have the robot eyes on me at the moment, so we're just going to let that ride. David there now has the rune Tomahawk, which I'm guessing from the way the game is designed is pretty much meant for him. I say that because technically Rock can also equip Tomahawks, but if you follow the game's progression and the way David is sort of positioned to be a prominent or major character in several ways... I think it's pretty clear that the Rune Tomahawk is meant for him much in the way that the Heat Axe was meant for Obright in Chapter 4 of Scenario 1. But you could give it to Rock. I find that David is usually more effective with Tomahawks anyway. Never mind the fact that he needs the boost anyway because he doesn't have access to a single range high damage weapon like Rock does. So I always give it to David. He has a naturally high critical rate in my experience. So giving him a weapon that boosts critical on top of that plus a weapon that at this stage is strong against most of the enemies that you're fighting, yeah, very useful. The Rune Tomahawk, or Accurate Axis is known in the localization of Scenario 1, has the same properties as Rapiers in Scenarios 2 and 3. It's strong against the Bull Zone characters, so in this chapter, pretty much everything that you're fighting, he is strong against. Because you fight a lot of characters who are weak against Tomahawks in general, so that's a double weakness there. So here... Off screen, I finished the battle in the shrine. I just picked up the robot eye. So here's something you can do. Now, even though I'm not testing that here, I'm pretty sure that even if the villager who has the robot eyes dies, you can pick up the robot eyes on this battlefield after the battle and still find them. So no matter what happens, if you have the ruin map, you can activate Robbie, who if you enter the shrine battle, Without going into the ruins, after the battle, you'll see him off screen there. So here we are, the battle's been won, so we're just walking here. I aggress from the Rainblood fight, which is up next. So you can just kind of casually stroll in with me, and you know. Nice leisurely walk, and he's got the robot eyes, and that's all we need to do this. Robbie the Mecha Soldier has joined the force. Now, it, don't get me wrong, it's more useful to have him join in battle because he can actually join in the fight straight away, give you an extra person. But I'm just showing you an alternative method. In case something goes wrong and you're pressed for time, anything happens, you have this as an option. You can just go in after the fight and pick him up. Now, I was just showing off there that you can't actually go through those other exits. You have to go out through the main entrance. Also, keep in mind that you do have to unlock those switches with zero in battle so yeah don't wait to do that you have to do that during the battle but you don't have to pick up Robbie during the battle so anyway here we are in chapter 5 the fifth ruin of the game this one is another one that's pretty simple and quick and easy as long as you know what you're doing so this is what you want to do thief comes in only two treasure chests to deal with here you'll notice a switch to the right of us you'll want to send your fastest character in the ruin to hit that switch in this case, it's Hedva or Hedova. 
everybody else can move forward. I usually just send two or three of my fastest people and everybody else who's in there, I will just send back out. Well, I usually leave one other person in just as backup to deal with the switch in case I move someone off prematurely and make a mistake. So one of those people would be going back outside in a moment. I don't need three people there. The thief will pick up the first item, which is the goddess tier. Hedva can just stand there for the time being. Arthur could advance. Though it's probably going to come down to David and Hazuki since at the moment they have better movement than him. David, thanks to the running pepper I gave him. Campbell won't be needed, so he can join the others outside. The rest will maintain their position. So the most important thing is, yeah, and I call myself there. You want it for now, leave whoever you have on that switch, on that switch. Don't back yourself into a corner where you can't get out and get to the thief. So we just want to basically stay out of his way. We don't want to block him off in any way. And that's kind of what I'm doing now. I'm watching to make sure I don't do that. We're fine, though. You could attack him early, and I don't think it'll throw his AI off, but you don't want to kill him too soon, so... Because you want that god rapier, I'm pretty sure, if for no other reason than Thanatos level 2. It doesn't have an agility boost like most rapiers, and it's holy versus a demon weapon. So it's not strong against the same weapons that the rapier is across the board, but it is strong against the undead, so it's still strong against a lot of the same enemies, just not all of them. And it is strong against certain enemies like the hell sniper who are a pain that you'll be dealing with pretty soon. So here we use the Sky Tomahawk to attack from a distance. Now the thieves are strong against axe type weapons so it won't kill them which is a bonus. Hazuki can come in with shurikens to do additional damage. So yeah they both have 3 range with their weapons currently so that's why they're good candidates in addition to their movement ability to deal with this ruin because you have to attack the thief through the door there. Thankfully the game allows you to attack through walls so there you go. Now he will not move so at this point we can open up the door there's really no need to you could just leave it as is to guarantee he doesn't escape because worst case scenario your characters miss both their attacks he dodges the doors are open next turn he's out but as long as you've gotten both items from him there's no reason to keep him around anyway so in the interest of getting out of here and continuing the game we'll call it a day so pretty simple and easy right as long as you know what's coming in beforehand and that will do it for Chapter 5's Ruins. We're going to get out of here, and I'll see you when we tackle the sixth and final ruin of the game. And here we are, just like that. This is Chapter 6's Ruins, the battle with Desherin, a.k.a. Death Helen. Don't ask me. Just showing off a few funny things about the game, you can actually inflict status elements on the barrels. You can put them to sleep, and it will always stick. So that's an easy way to gain experience. You get a lot of experience for using status effects like charm and sleep and slow and confuse even if they don't stick to a regular enemy you will get a minimum of two weapon experience for using these spells so even if they miss so please keep that in mind slow is excellent in shiny force 3 because unlike the earlier shiny force titles it always sticks to its target it always affects them so you're guaranteed the experience you're guaranteed the status effect and in case of the barrels easy weapon experience and easy way to gain friendships Anytime one character casts slow or sleep or confuse or charm or any status effect on a target and somebody else attacks them, that counts as friendship. So, and since we took out the barrel and they're counted as an enemy for some reason, that was actually two friendship points there instead of one, which you'd get for a standard hit that did not kill. So we're just getting our people in position. Usual thing, we want to have our fastest person inspect. Everybody else will go in. You don't need to send a lot of people into this ruin. It's actually pretty easy and straightforward, but you can. Hazuki, they're picking up the goddess tier from the barrel on the way. You'll definitely want to leave a lot of people to protect Median. Give him some backup, because some of the enemies will come right at you. You also don't want to advance too far towards Death Helen, because that will trigger the thieves prematurely. So really, as long as you are getting close to the door, they will not activate too soon. So careful how you position your people. Uryudo is just playing catch up here. Jade is going to show off another nice little trick here. Some people might miss this. They're hiding two barrels very cleverly there. You want to attack this barrel because this is hiding one of the best lances in the game. That would be the Ultra Lance. In this version, it's known as the Gungnir. And it'll get him a level. Fantastic. Not to mention five weapon experience, which he needs because 
he's a little bit behind, only ranked 2, I think. Now, I say the Gunyir is one of the best, because even though it has the best attack, or it's tied with the Dragonlance for attack, and it does have an instant kill ability, I personally say the Dragonlance at this stage is the best lance in the game. Because they both have the same attack, and I personally prefer a special attack that the Dragonlance gives, than the instant kill ability that the Ultra Lance gives for very specific reasons. One, the Dragon Breath attack is one of the highest damage special attacks for any weapon in the game. So it deals ridiculous damage. Unless the character that you're attacking has a natural immunity to fire, it's going to deal ridiculous damage. Never mind the high attack that it naturally has. Now, with the instant kill abilities, I don't like instant kill abilities actually. They're good in a pinch, they can make things a lot easier, but I don't like them for that reason. They make the game too easy. Taking out a target in one hit just takes all the fun out of it. Also, it reduces my ability to stack up friendships between my people. If one person just comes in and kills them, you know, no one else can come in and join in on the fun. Also, it reduces the amount of experience you're going to get for the kill. Because experience in this game is based in part by how much damage you did to the enemy versus other factors. So, an instant kill is going to reduce the potential experience you're going to get for killing them. So, I'd rather do high damage with something like a Dragon Lance get the maximum amount of experience versus Centurion or uh, what's a death charge kill them in one hit utterly destroy them there's gonna be a cap on how much experience I get so now if they're a really high level opponent you're gonna get 49 regardless but if they're not if you're getting anything less than 49 experience for the kill then you will notice the difference based on what attack you do so keep that in mind again it's a matter of personal choice I prefer the Dragon Lance over the gun year for that reason though yeah, when I first played the game, I was fine with the instant destruction. In fact, it was kind of cool because it was a new thing. But after a while, once you really get to understand the mechanics of the game, I just learned that in the long run, it's better to just go with another type of weapon. Also, scenarios 2 and 3 make the Dragon Lance even better than scenario 1. Because in scenarios 2 and 3, it has an additional property. It's not just strong against sword and blade users. It's strong against monsters and beasts. Anything classified as a magical creature. And that's a lot of enemies in this game. Anything from Hydras and Hellhounds to Cerberus and Griffins, etc. All these types of enemies, even Wyverns, are weak to the Dragonlands. So that makes it even better. And in Shining Force scenarios 2 and 3, you'll find that weapons that give an additional strength property against a certain type of enemy are the strongest in the game because that allows them to do horrendous amounts of damage. If you don't believe me, give somebody like Frank or Cyclops or Unoma the Tiger Claw and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, horrendous damage. Or give them a Giant Cestus. You know. So the Thief just picked up the first treasure chest there. We have a Running Ring, aka Nimble Ring. is going to boost any character's movement by two. I notice a lot of players don't prefer to use this. I find it very useful for certain characters. I usually give it to somebody like Hera, or Waltz, or Robbie. Anybody who could benefit from the extra movement, really. As always, we're going to take out the barrels. You want to have access to all paths, and of course that weapon experience is always nice. In this ruin, you want to send in David, Campbell, Hazuki, Arthur, the usual suspects, according to your playstyle and preference. Level 10 for Campbell there. I like to send in casters for reasons I stated earlier. It's entirely up to you. Hazuki is always excellent for obvious reasons. Ranged attack plus magic. 7 movement. She's the perfect ruin raider, really. It's unfortunate that most Shining Force games don't give you a ninja as early in the game as you get her. But that's one of the reasons why she becomes so good. If you got her as late as you got Murasame and Hagane, she would not be nearly as good of a character as she is. So I'm thankful for that. One other character that you can send into this ruin if you want to be a completionist is Zero. The treasure chest all the way to the west is elevated on a high platform, so only he can reach it. It only has a dark matter though, so at this stage in the game, you've probably gotten a couple of dark matters. You only got one chaos ring, you do the math. 
And here it is, the dark matter. I usually make one cursed weapon to give to somebody and give them the chaos ring, so you really don't need more dark matter than that. So, if you like to play with cursed weapons though, or if you want to have a cursed weapon run, by all means, here's an extra one for you. We're just going to take out the Bloodborns, who in this scenario are actually pretty beefy, so... Scenario 1, you know, after Chapter 4, they were kind of a joke. But they're actually pretty respectable enemies in this version. You know, it takes somebody like a Campbell with the Mithril Lance at level 3 weapons to deal good damage. And even there, he didn't just one-shot it. Oh, okay, he's ranked 3 now, okay. But he has the Holy Lance, which is a Holy-based weapon, so it deals double damage to them, so... Yeah, they don't stand a chance. Same goes for the Silver Spear, if you have that equipped. Arthur picking up another small mithril from that barrel, so keep that in mind. You want all the small mithril you can find. Accessories are more useful than some of the mithril weapons in a way, depending on how you want to play. Master rings for the plus 10 critical encounter is very useful. Magic rings for the ability to cast a magic regen as an item is very useful. Usually grants plus 9 or plus 10 MP on average. As long as it doesn't break, you can reuse it. Plus, it gives your healers 10 experience points. So, very useful item to keep strictly as an item. I don't equip it, but as an item, it's very useful. Uh, Apollo pin, Artemis pin, go without saying. Power ring is one of the most versatile items. Plus 5 attack and defense to any character. Always good to have. Gale ring, also plus 5 defense and agility. Another good item for your slower characters like Robbie. Or Jade or Garrosh. Who else? Uh, Papets or Papets. I'm pretty sure his name is a play on the word puppets since he is a bit of a puppet master himself. Arthur here, another good character to send in. He has all the perks that come with being a knight class character. Also has access to magic so he can use Blaze and Freeze to do a little damage to the thief, ensuring they don't die. And we picked up all the treasure he had long ago. This thief has the crystal rod or Tiamat rod, which we do want. So we're going to be dealing with him in a moment, and that will about wrap up this ruin and this video. So it's always nice to have a visual reference in some situations, which is why I made these guys. And I'll be doing the same for Scenario 3 when the time comes. Because there's a couple of ruins in Scenario 3 that are particularly tricky. If it's your first time playing, even with the guide on Jumison, and thank you Jumison and all the people who put that together. Without that guide, I would not have been able to get through the ruins my first time playing the import versions of this back in the day. Way before the idea of translating these games was even a thought in my brain. And at that moment, I'd like to take a second to thank the translation team for all the hard work that they put into these games. I mean, the game was still fun to play in Japanese, but being able to know what's going on just makes it so much more fulfilling and that will about be a wrap for chapter six and all of scenario two's ruins thanks for watching i hope this guide has been helpful to you take care and see you soon